Hello, my name is Dr. Mark Rafe. I'm one of the sports medicine doctors at Wakefield Sports and Exercise Clinic on Angus Street in Adelaide. And the following is a few minutes talk on concussion in sport for schools. The concussion is getting more and more recognition in all the papers today. Uh, and almost every week there's another headline. Um, this from the conversation, an online investigative journal. Uh, concussion risks aren't limited to the AFL. We need urgent action to make sure our kids are safe too. The point of this article was about how we need to have standard protocols and assessment criteria for everyone, um, but especially children, um, for their uh, for concussion risk and for monitoring concussion. Um, the AFL consider it such a major um, issue that they're devoting $25 million a year for the next 80 years to build up a almost a $2 billion trust for payouts, for player compensation, for research uh, into concussion and headlocks. Um, and just this year, 2021, uh, the AFL and SANFL have uh, introduced a protocol for at least 12 days uh, players can be sidelined or should be sidelined for at least 12 days if they suffer a concussion. Uh, and this doubles the amount of time that um, used to be the case, i.e. six days. Um, the main website you should have a look at um, for parents, teachers, coaches uh, is a national website. So there's been a lot of federal and national uh, time and effort sort of spent into getting a consensus statements on what we should all be doing with um, people who are concussed. So please have a look at this website, Concussion and Sport. Uh, and there's a hyperlink there on the on the PowerPoint. And uh, this drop down menus for the athletes, uh, parents and teachers, coaches, and medical practitioners. Very useful website. Um, so what is concussion? The expert group, Concussion and Sport Group International Consensus Statement, defies concussion as a traumatic brain injury induced by biomechanical forces, i.e. It's any knock that transmits a force to the head. It doesn't have to be a head knock as such. It just needs to transmit the force to the head. Um, and the brain tissue itself um, is, is damaged. So not damaged to the point where a CT scan or MRI can see it. Uh, by definition, if there is something to see on an MRI scan, it's not a concussion. Um, it's uh, basically, it's if you're knocked out, if you have any balance issues when you try and stand up again or any brain neurological symptoms like you appear to be a bit slow or dopey, uh, you have a headache, more emotional than usual, and of course any neurological symptoms like tingling or numbness in your arms or legs, uh, then that is what a concussion is. So a concussion affects the brain tissue by altering the biochemistry that happens inside the individual cells. So the little uh, ion channels that open up and let calcium and potassium and other electrolytes flow in and out through the axon or the neural cell, that all changes. So the chemical factory inside the cell is affected. So the biochemical processes within that uh, brain cell neuron is altered and causes uh, symptoms such as um, you know the headaches and emotional sleeping troubles. Um, in adults, as an over 18 year old, those physical symptoms of headaches and, um, and uh, foggy feelings, the physical symptoms can last 7 to 14 days um, and up to 4 weeks if you're under 18 years of age. The cognitive impairment, so the issues about thinking, remembering, attention to detail, can last 3 to 4 days at least after the resolution of physical symptoms. So that after the headaches go, it can be quite a few days at least uh, until all that thinking ability comes back. And it may be longer in under 18 year olds. Um, in some research, they have shown that the blood tests that um, look for proteins that are dumped into the bloodstream with damaged brain tissue, uh, they are positive. These research based blood tests looking for concussion or, or injury to cell neurons inside the brain. They're positive up to two weeks after the adult symptoms improve, and so far no research like that in, in children exists, as I understand it. And some studies have shown that cerebral brain flow uh, is altered for months afterwards. 
So the information we're giving you today um, may well change in the years to come um, as the science develops. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare shows that 58,000 or close to 60,000 people were hospitalised um, for sports injuries. Um, and these injuries, basically that was concussions, so 58,000 sort of concussions. And of those, it's a little bit more male than female. Our most common age group is in that 15 to 24 year olds. The most uh, frequently affected sports are uh, Aussie rules, rugby and soccer. The fractures are the number one most common form of injury and followed by all sorts of intracranial injury. And of course, concussion is one type of intracranial injury. Other types of intracranial injuries may be bleeds inside the head. Um, so concussion incidents um, in women and the AFLW in 2020 was shown to be pretty stable over the last couple of years, with about 11, close to 12 uh, incidences per 1,000 playing hours. And a, an associate professor, Professor Pierce, uh, at La Trobe University, was quoted as saying, out of Canada, it suggests that there's a threefold increase in concussion rates in men over the years, but a sixfold increase in concussion rates in women. So women are more... Um, likely to get concussion events than, than men. And to children and under 18 year olds, uh, previously concussed children have four times the risk of sustaining concussion compared with those who have no previous concussion. Uh, and that was from a British Journal of Sports Medicine article just last year and they looked at seven studies with over 23,000 children. So one very useful uh, tool, and you can download this off the web, uh, is a concussion recognition tool. It's designed for parents and teachers and um, coaches. Uh, it's got recognising and how to recognise concussion and what to do. Um, some red flags, which are uh, the signs when you need to call an ambulance. Uh, step two, some, some signs that, that may show like poor balance if they're disorientated uh, or slow to get up. Some, those signs might indicate concussion. And some of the symptoms as well. <clears throat> headaches, blurred vision, more emotional, sensitive to the light. Um, there's a good list there. A little memory assessment um, if those questions are all okay. And if they suspect a concussion, some ideas about what not to do or what to do, like not to be left alone, don't drink alcohol. So a very useful tool for mums and dads out there. <clears throat> From a medical assessment point of view, when we get someone with uh, suspected concussion at the Adelaide Concussion Clinic, at Wakefield Sports is an exercise clinic. Uh, we do what's called a primary survey where we make sure that the obviously the airways, breathing, circulation and D for disability, that the neck is okay, that neurologically they're fine. And that's often more something you'll do on the sidelines as a, as a doctor or a physiotherapist if you put in that position. Anyone with first aid uh, are doing your ABCs. And neck and neurological assessment can be done at the same time. So if someone's knocked out um, you've got to assume that they might have a neck injury unless they're awake and can actually tell you the neck's fine. Um, if there's any uh, worries about their neck, just keep them still and wait for the ambulance to arrive. In the rooms when we get them, we'll do what's called a secondary survey, so a top-to-toe um, examination, looking for fractures, other acute injuries, facial damage, tooth injuries, uh, chest trauma, abdominal trauma, any fractures in the limbs. Um, once we go through that, then we'll do concussion tests, uh, and a common one um, which is used and recommended by the AIS and all the major sports in Australia is the SCAT-5, so that stands for the Sports Concussion Assessment Tool number 5. And we go through that, and based on this then we do a letter for school, for the coaches, for the club, uh, just saying you know, where the player is up to um, in regards to their management for the next few days. So immediate management in that short term is to make sure that that player um, remains in the company of a responsible adult and make sure that adult's not drinking, that they can drive somewhere if they need to be, that they've got access to a telephone, a mobile phone, that they can call for help 911 if they need to. Be advised not to drink alcohol. Um, so that's just to make sure that if later that they're getting um, you know, tired or start throwing up, there's no other drugs in their system that could mask or confuse the symptoms. Make sure they're not allowed to drive back from the sports field. Um, 
And that's obviously to make sure that, because if you have a concussion, you're not making decisions properly, you're incoordinated, you may have an accident. Um, so it's really important for coaches and parents to make sure that all the emergency contact details are up to date with the school or club. And specifically, the concussed students should avoid aspirin and anti-inflammatories to make sure it doesn't thin their blood, just in case they have a bleeding uh, issue in their brain, and that would exacerbate it. Uh, making sure they don't take anything like sleeping tablets if they're trying to get to sleep. Because again, if they're too sleepy, too dopey, it's actually hard to uh, make sure to see what their conscious level's like. And any sedating pain medications like Panadine Forts or stronger painkillers. So Panadol's uh, fine in this instance. So the, and this is straight from the AIS uh, Concussion and Sport uh, website, the initial steps we do are that diagnosis, we make sure the player is not returning to sport, um, and a relative rest, and deliberately so for the first one to two days, um, to make sure that the uh, brain isn't jogged or, or damaged even more inside the brain, and that includes even just a light jog, so sometimes the jogging action is enough to sort of make the brain go, you know, jiggle around in its little box, and to cause any further injuries. So just down this flow chart, um, with deliberate physical and cognitive rest, that last blue box you saw. You can see the steps on the left, which are the graduated return to learning and some light aerobic activity until symptom free. So that means you can walk around. Uh, in fact, walking might be great, might be a very good thing to sort of help restore that normal brain circulation. Um, and until the symptoms go, that's all you're doing, you're just taking it easy. You may have a day or two off school, maybe some half days. When you get back to school, um, then no um, you know, particular emphasis on doing exams. Um, make sure that assignments, there's the longer time to do them. Um, because the student really can't concentrate and won't be able to do their best. So once um, they're symptom free, at least for um, 24 to 48 hours, you can do some sport specific drills, some skill stuff no contact, um, and you start to jog as well. So as long as you feel fine jogging, um, usually what you do then is sort of wait another 24 hours. If you had a jog, you feel fine, then you can do some jogging and skills work. More complex uh, drills can be done. And then a full review before full contact training. And in children or under at the age of 18, you're going to wait 14 days from complete resolution of their symptoms Till then you start uh, putting them in a position where it's possible that they may be uh, having a contact or collisions. So that's two weeks after they have no symptoms is when you can start doing contact training. So we do a medical review before you do contact training. Um, you can start doing some spoiling if you're doing AFL football, um, some light tackling and then heavy tackling and then games. Return to full contact training, make sure they're fine from that, so fine the next day, um, then it's a return to sport. So as you can see, it's a very gradu graduated process. Same for the adults, um, in that it's walking around till you're symptom free, um, then drills, then jogging, or jogging and, and drills, no contact drills. Um, make sure you get checked up before starting to get into contact training. And just notice it hasn't got that green... 14-day um, um, period um, of, of no training. So that's important. Um, the next thing is our pathway sort of at the ACC or Adelaide Concussion Clinic. So we do the initial diagnosis. We monitor for progression of the resolution of symptoms so the symptoms are getting better and plan a bit of a graduated return to sport. What does that look like? What, what are we like them to be doing? And then finally is a clearance to return to full contact training after that graded return to sports completed. And so often there's about three consultations with a doctor. So there's an initial diagnosis, there's the checkup to make sure things are getting better, and there's that final checkup uh, before full contact training. Uh, in the initial meeting, often we'll do a full neurological assessment, do a SCAT5 test, um, get uh, an advice sheet sort of written up, uh, for, the, for the players, for the mums or dads, and, and for the, or for the boarding school. 
as we assess progress, we might redo the SCAT5 test, and this is where the Cognogram test might be useful. So Cognogram being the online computer-based neuropsychological testing. So the things we use, we, do, we might redo the SCAT5 test form. If it's more than five days or seven days afterwards, you may not do the SCAT5, we might even just uh, do the symptoms. So uh, in this slide set, I uh, don't have the SCAT5 here for you to look at, but you can look at it online. Basically, a SCAT5 is uh, going through the um, memory questions, um, getting the uh, you know student to remember some words, recite them back to us. We do that a few times. We then get them to remember those words, and we go back to them a few minutes down the track to see what their memory is like. Uh, doing some numbers backwards, see what their concentration is like. Um, then we do some balance tests, a neurological uh, test to make sure their nerves and neck are okay. We go back to retest those words again, and we come up with a score. It's important to know that that score is not an in or an out test. It's just another tool that we use to sort of help make our assessment. Uh, the Cognogram test is important uh, often for players who are not sure whether they're ready to come back or not. Often their physical symptoms are a lot better, but they're not quite right. And so we can do a computerized test to see uh, what what their brain is doing. Um, so then we do that as a pro as a progress. We do that graded return back to sport uh, and a letter to advise the coaches and stuff about what uh, we think they need to do. And then there's a final clearance where we assess the progress, the return to sport, the, checked off all those things, and then they're cleared for full uh, training. May or may not do a SCAT five at the time. May or may not do a cognogram. Um, um, but we'll go through the symptoms and then do a letter of, of clearance. Um, often when the uh, people turn up for a concussion assessment, uh, they'll be sat down in the waiting room as they're waiting for the doctor and they'll fill in the SCAT5 symptom list. So there's 22 symptoms and uh, a number of severities. So there's about six different uh, gradings of severity of symptoms. Uh, the cognogram, we can do it in the waiting room, and more often we get people to do it at home. Um, and, you know, we need to keep an eye on people, so it may be more than two or three consultations that people need. For the under-18s, we know that they have a slower rate of recovery from concussion. Remember, it can take up to four weeks. It's considered relatively normal for um, younger uh, players to come back from concussion. Uh, they have unique physical, uh, cognitive, and emotional differences. They're smaller so less mass to absorb the shock of the tackle or hitting the ground. Uh, cognitive issues, you know, year 12s, all the stresses and worries are getting through those major exams. And they've got developing brains. They're still neurologically developing. They're more vulnerable to concussion because of that developing brain, the decreased myelination, which means that the covering of the nerves that needs to happen for their brains to grow properly. They often have less muscles around the neck, poor cervical musculature, an increased head-to-neck ratio, so the heads are often a little bit bigger than the adult ratios, and so a bigger target area. And there also is a role for cerebral blood flow alteration, so there's an alteration to the blood flow to the brain, uh, and that's been studied. Return to learn is a, um, a nice saying too. It's really important to sort of have a bit of a progress plan about not only how the athlete goes back to training, but also how they go back to the schoolwork. So a lot of schools often will have a more formalised um, concussion protocol. So it might be a day or two off, um, a couple of half days, and then going back into school. Um, again, like we talked about with um, maybe not doing exams, or if exams are done, that there is a note or the teachers are aware that they have concussion. If there are assignments, they might have longer time to do them. Um, and all the teachers sort of know across the board that there's a, there's a protocol in place. Um, and, you know, for under-18s, that return to, to learn is a priority over, over the return to sport. Um, and as the last point, so they might need more regular breaks and rests, um, and permission to go to the sick room, uh, and maybe even a medication order like Panadol to be signed so they can have it if they have headaches. So the tools that we currently have, um, not only asking um, and examining the neurological system, SCAT5 is important. For symptoms and memory, the balance and neurological tests. Researchers doing blood tests and spit tests, even to sort of try and diagnose concussion or brain injuries based on these tests. Um, MRI scans are used occasionally, 
and they're more in the setting of prolonged concussion. Um, the emergency departments might do a CT scan if a player has been knocked out for a significant amount of time, and that depends on the emergency department protocols. But usually, some of them would go any amount of loss of consciousness or do a CT scan. Some might do a minute or two minutes. Um, if we see them, uh, basically we'll be doing an MRI scan to see if there's any bleeding inside the head. MRI is basically a big magnet. If there is bleeding or even a very small amount, uh, hemoglobin's got iron in it. So iron obviously shows up in magnet fields very easily. And we can see if there's small uh, bleeds which may be missed on the CT scan. Um, we can use the cognogram test to see how the brain's functioning. Um, and sometimes we will do referrals to psychologists, neuropsychologists, uh, and neurologists uh, to uh, assess the, uh, the patient. So the cognogram test is an um, online test uh, that's, that's done at home usually. It's a series of four tests. It's basically like a card game. Um, is the card turned over? Have you seen the card before? Is it red? Um, is it the same card as the previous card? So these things are assessed. Four domains of psychomotor function, attention, learning, working memory, um, and print out a report. So how that will work is the, uh, the doctor will go back with the patient, um, will ask for a cognogram test, and you'll be emailed, or the student will be emailed, um, a link to the test, and that link's valid for three days. When you click on the test, then you can do it. It takes 10 to 15 minutes, and it's good to do it in a controlled environment, so it's quiet, um, the student's focusing on the, on the task, they're not distracted by the noises, um, and so it's a pretty standardized test, um, which is great. So as an example of the sort of uh, results you might get back, so you get abnormal, borderline, or normal tests, and in a lot of cases, if elite sport, they'll do baseline testing. So we'll see where the student has been before. But they don't need to. So these tests are normalized against um, thousands and thousands of people their age and at their level of schooling. And we get these sorts of results. And you can see how the trend changes over time. Uh, in this particular student's case, they uh, had repeated concussions and actually felt quite crook for a number of months. Um, but you can see and you can get trend lines, you can see which way they're going, they're improving or getting worse. Um, and then you can alter training and advise school appropriately on how they're doing. So that sort of summarises a bit about what we do um, from a concussion point of view. And other services we have at Wakefield include all the sports medicine, looking at injuries, um, uh, asthma, heart issues, um, arthritis care. We do a lot of this sort of stuff. We've got great physiotherapists, podiatrists, dietitians, psychologists, we've got exercise physiologists, great massage person. Um, we've got an orthopedic clinic upstairs as well as a fracture clinic. So the orthopedic surgeons we work very closely with. Um, they're very helpful and get people in very quickly. Fracture clinic uh, is headed up by Professor Mark Rickman, from a, a professor from the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Um, performance rehabilitation with strength and conditioning work. Um, I do acupuncture and sports hypnotherapy as well. So we offer quite a range of different things. And we've got a weekend sports injury clinic that hopefully you don't have to use, but we're open on Saturdays and Sundays all over winter. And over summer we're open on Saturdays. So thank you for your attention. I hope that's answered some of your questions. And uh, please have a, a very active day and a great rest of the week. Thank you.